Yeah, and uh, so uh, for those of you that don't know about the like the second Peter reference uh, or two Peter reference, uh, basically in that it, they uh, the the author of two Peter ends up uh, fabricating a, a physical encounter with Jesus as like a rebuttal to people who say that they just follow cleverly devised myths, and then um, the Ignatius uh, uh, thing I believe is is Ignatius actually responding to. A, I guess a Christian heresy or something like that, where it says that uh, uh, Christ or Jesus uh, didn't appear to anybody until he was shown as a bright star in the sky. Yeah, right. And, well, there, no, that's one. That's true. That's also in Ignatius. Okay. But Ignatius also has the section where he's very adamantly insistent that you must believe in the Jesus who was really crucified by Pilate, who was really born to Mary and really did eat with disciples and the disciples really did meet and so on. Um He's very concerned about these Christians who are denying all these things, right? So that, that's that's an important one. Um, I do cite both of these. If people go to the Chrissy Hansen article I did on my blog, uh, and and in there I talk about Second Peter and Ignatius. I think I drop a reference to them, and then link to my discussions of those two. And then you can follow those those links uh, to get into more detail of why I think what I do about these. And even if people are going to say, "Well, but you could reinterpret this stuff." The point being is that it there it at best, even at best for the historicist position, it tracks both ways equally well. Like you can interpret it both ways, both meanings fit the texts equally well. I think the historicist meaning fits even less. I think it fits poorly. And I think the myths just reading fits very well. Um, but even at best, if you push it, you only get it at 50-50, which means it's this you can't say we don't have evidence of this because it looks like we do. Uh, and the only way to get rid of that evidence is to attack it with assumptions rather than admit that the evidence is ambiguous. It looks like it could go either way. And in fact, it looks a little stronger on the, the other side. Right. So um, people need to reapproach this stuff without their assumptions and look at it in context for what's actually being said in the time that's being said and so on. And, and don't make these like, sort of uh, presuppositions uh, when you're interpreting the text. Right. And uh, before we move on to our next clip, because our next clip is intimately tied with this particular topic. Um, and so just to kind of summarize, and you can correct me if I'm wrong uh, there, Carrier, uh, but w- would, wouldn't you say that this is um, th- these three uh, sources are uh, show that, uh, that there at least were Christians and, and I guess non-Christians that were uh, at least uh, entertaining the idea of a of a celestial Christ, or at least a Christ that may not necessarily be based on historical evidence, or may may not have any kind of evidence uh, to support the existence of this supposed person. Right? Yeah. Uh, so the celestial details in particular are less attested. Um, mm-hmm. They're they're not clear about it. Right. So saying if these other Christians are saying that these are cleverly devised myths what were they saying they were instead, right? So like, we're not told, right? Because they don't want us to know that, right? They, they, want, they want those people to be shunned, right? So they're, they're basically polemically attacking them and telling their fellow Christians to not even talk to them. So we don't get to hear what those other Christians were actually teaching, like what, what alternative they were teaching, we don't know. So we have to infer that from other outside evidence and context and things like that. Uh, and that's what Doherty did, and that's what I did in On the Historicity of Jesus. Letaster then vets that in his book, Questioning the Historicity of Jesus. So, so that we can only get at indirectly. You did drop one reference to Ignatius does have this, this weird reference to the star gospel. Um, he doesn't call it the star gospel. But that's just, it, it's some sort of gospel in, in, in which Jesus becomes a star. Uh, and it does not fit Matthew. It's not tracking that. It's not tracking any known gospel. We have no gospel that matches his narrative. Um, we have hints of that Irenaeus knew this gospel because he references some of the same things that Ignatius does, but we don't have this gospel. Uh, but it, it's in, in this gospel, the birth and death of Jesus are hidden. Like no one knows about it until after the resurrection, Jesus becomes this super bright star that all the heavenly hosts see. And then all the demons feel tricked and they're like, Oh my God, what happened? Where, what the hell? Uh, and then that's how Jesus gets power over the demons and yada, yada and Christian Christianity proceeds. But so there, so this is a weird gospel, right? And it does look very similar to what we see in the Ascension of Isaiah. Um, so, so there, so there's that leads into that whole can of worms. I know Chrissy Hansen hates my position on the Ascension of Isaiah, but, um, <laughs> but there, there is overlap. There is curious overlap between the the triad of Irenaeus, 
Ignatius and the Ascension and this star gospel. So there's some lost gospel that these guys are referencing. Uh, I strongly suspect, I can't prove this and I don't base any conclusions on this because I can't prove it, but I do strongly suspect that that star gospel is what's been torn out of the Ascension of Isaiah. I think it was the original, uh, and, and of course we're only hearing paraphrases. We're not hearing an exact, you know, so we don't have the text. Mm-hmm. We just have Ignatius referring to it and paraphrasing it. We have Irenaeus referring to it and paraphrasing it. Um, but I think they're referring to a gospel, I think, that was the original middle part of the Ascension of Isaiah chapter 11. Um, but again, like I said, I don't, I don't base any conclusions on that. I don't require that to be true. It's just a thing that I suspect. Um, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that would get into a whole other uh, digression. But, but that's what I meant when you asked about the celestial Jesus, is that we have some hints. Like in Irenaeus, he talks about the people talking about uh, celestial births. Um, Aaron Adair uh, has a paper. I don't know that he's published it yet. Uh, but he's working on it. He's presented it at a conference, a biblical studies conference already on how revelation seems to be one of these texts. Uh, It seems to say that Jesus was born in outer space uh, and that Mary was fled to outer space and so on. Um, It does seem to say that, uh, but revelation is so wackadoo and so symbolic uh, that it's hard to like know what to take literally and what is just figurative. So I've never used it as a text or as evidence. Uh, I'm intrigued by Aaron Adair's work on it uh, and because I've seen it and I think um, people should look for it. When he does eventually publish it, it's, it's going to be worthwhile. Uh, whether it holds up or not, it's going to be an interesting analysis of the text. But that's the kind of thing we have to do. We, have, we can only get at it indirectly because all the direct evidence has been destroyed or lost because that isn't the sect that survived. It isn't the sect that got to decide what books to preserve for us to read them now. So, or what state to preserve them in. Right. So, uh, mm-hmm. and we know the Christians doctored all kinds of stuff. We know they made up all kinds of stuff. We know they destroyed all kinds of stuff, uh, or just didn't preserve it, um, which is a monster, the same thing for our, our perspective. Um, and they, we know they didn't want to talk about stuff like in this case, like in Ignatius, And second Peter, they very carefully avoid going into detail about what their opposing Christian sects are arguing. They're just polemically attacking them and denouncing them and then telling their fellow Christians what they're supposed to believe instead. So from that, we just have to infer what the other Christians were saying. Right. So uh, Mm -hmm. we don't get to hear it from that. So we have to infer things. So we have to go at things uh, in that way. And that's because the evidence is so compromised uh, by the, the extreme bias, especially the Middle Ages. Um, and the way evidence has been preserved for us to read it. Right. And so would you say that um, there would be no reason for them to mention like these possibilities or or these ideas unless they were somehow uh, at least being expressed like uh, by by a community or by people in general, right? Yeah, yeah. And yet they still avoid, like they're acknowledging that these other teachings exist but they avoid articulating what they are, right? The way they respond to them is by telling their readers what they're supposed to believe instead, right? So, so that, so they're, even there, they're trying to hide from us what the actual teaching is. They're going out of their way to do this. The way their rhetoric is formed is they're trying to not talk about it. And they're trying to tell Christians not to talk to those Christians to talk about it, right? Like they, they don't want it. They don't want it known. They're trying to suppress the evidence and the knowledge and the, and the, the, the actual teaching. Uh, and so we and we have lots. Of, this isn't the only evidence we have of Christians trying to get other Christians to not listen to things and not know things. Uh, we, we see that a lot. Destruction of documents. We know like the Gospel of Peter was actively destroyed. We have direct references to efforts to burn all the copies of the Gospel of Peter, for example. Um, <clears throat> so so we know they were, they were also actively destroying documents. We know they were just throwing them in the trash. We know they were uh, altering documents, you know, removing things, adding things, and so on. We know they were doing all that. We have tons of examples of this being regular Christian practice. Uh, and so this makes it very difficult for us to get at what was really going on, because it's it's like trying to understand the history of Russia, but only getting to read USSR propaganda literature, right? Mm-hmm. You don't get any other information. You can only read approved Russian propaganda and then trying to reconstruct the actual history of the USSR, right? Like it's, that's the kind of thing that we're looking at here is we have this extreme control of documentation of what we get to see and hear. Uh, and we have to kind of get behind that. Uh, and, and that makes it difficult. That makes everything ambiguous and, uh, means that we don't have smoking guns. So we, we can't be absolutely certain of anything because we're, we're dealing in this, this sort of compromised information space. Yeah. Now, 
uh, Chrissy uh, claims to have found the first reference to, uh, you know, people not believing in a purely historical Christ or historical Jesus. And uh, she has a quite interesting way to make this determination. Oh, but yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that we have no, uh, like from the 1600s, we don't have any actual mythicist texts. Um, but we know that they existed. And we know they existed because of references like this in the works of Grotius. Because why are you arguing that Jesus existed as a real person unless someone's talking about how Jesus didn't exist? Like, you have no reason to, to argue that he existed unless that was in the public consciousness. Right. Yeah, spot on. Um, you could literally just <laughs> run that clip. Spot on. <laughs> you could run. You could just talk about Ignatius and Second Peter, and then run that clip. And Chrissy Hansen is arguing our position. <laughs> That's exactly what we're saying. That's literally exactly what we're saying uh, about Second Peter and Ignatius. Um, and she's right. I think like like her methodology is correct here. Is that uh, in the 17th century, the fact that there are people making these arguments in, very strongly indicates that there were people making the other side of that argument. Uh, and also it means that they don't want us to know about that. Like they're suppressing it. They're censoring. Uh, you know, we, we only get to hear about the, the pro-Christian side or the pro-Catholic Orthodox side. We don't get to hear the other side. Uh, and now we do eventually later uh, when uh, the Catholic Church loses control, basically, of the ability to censor. I mean, the whole failure to try and censor Galileo uh, is that was the death knell for Catholic ability to control information. And then you have the Enlightenment, and then people can publish anything they want, and the church can bitch and moan about it and they can't stop it, uh, is, is what happens, right? So after the 1600s, um, then yes, we get that's when we start getting actual, we have surviving mythicist texts that we can read. Uh, and Chrissy Hansen talks about the history of that and everything. Uh, but she's also right, like you go back 100 years. And you see already one half of this argument is going on. And that tells you that, yeah, there, there were people arguing the other half of that argument. We just don't have any of those documents. And that's a perfectly sound way to argue. And it's exactly the way we have to argue with early Christianity for the exact same reason, because of the control of information and the way that information has been compromised in its way to us. Uh, and yeah, we have texts just like that. We have Second Peter, we have Ignatius. So, um, and I would, I would include, you know, the dialogue with Trifo, even though that's not uh, an opposing Christian sect. It's just a casual Jewish doubter um, that is a fictional one, but I think it's meant to be, meant to at least represent the, the typical kind of Jewish arguer that you, a Christian would run into, right? I think uh, Justin wants to cre create this argument that people can use. Um, it's possibly straw manning the Jewish argument. Um, I, I think it's, it would be counterproductive for Justin to do that because I think he wants to create a manual for defeating uh, these arguments. But as I just did a blog recently on today, current Christian apologetics, completely failing to do this. <laughs> uh, it's entirely possible that Justin is straw manning Trifo, not realizing that he's shooting himself in the foot, uh, at, you know, rhetorically. But um, either way, though, but uh, Trifo is, his, is a Jew in his mind uh, that he's interacting. But still, the fact that he imagines that there are Jews who would challenge the historicity of Jesus, who would say, we think you, all your stuff is made up. Uh, you just believe false stories. Um, you know, that that is entirely believable uh, and, and and probably is the case. So it's probably were tons of people who were that kind of skeptic uh, in that perspective. And then, of course, gradually later, we see, you know, more and more insistence that the Gospels have to be true. So you like Tertullian after this. So after the dialogue with Trifo, about 10, 20 years later, um, you have Tertullian insisting the Gospels have been preserved uh, in uh, they've been preserved, handed down from the original apostles who wrote them from generation to generation in these churches. So they, they can't possibly be doctored. They can't possibly be false. <laughs> right. So this is like a really adamant defense of the historicity uh, argument. Um, but of course, at the time, they're arguing that it's, it's all or nothing for them. It's either Jesus is all the magical Jesus or he didn't exist at all. Uh, this this idea of extracting a plausible historical Jesus, that's a modern methodological concept. Uh, it's a rational, reasonable concept, but that's the kind of rational way we do history now. But back then, that wasn't in the battlefield of religions. That, that wasn't 
usually the way things were going. Um, you would you would get more of a polemical attack, like Kelsis will say, "Oh, yeah, sure, maybe your gospels are based on some true thing, but Jesus was just another huckster. We know a lot of these hucksters, right?" Um, now, Kelsis didn't know that; he had no evidence that Jesus was a huckster. Uh, but he just finds that as a, a useful rhetorical attack because there isn't any way to disprove it, right? So that's why Kelsus uses that a move. Uh, why Kelsus uses that move rather than attacking the historicity of Jesus, because that would be a polemically weaker argument, if you understand. So Kelsus wants to make a rhetorically strong argument, and a strong argument is one that grants as much as you possibly can to your opponent. Right. So that, that makes your argument as strong as possible. So that's why Kelsus is taking that position. Um, we probably know more about this if we had Kelsus. We don't. We only have Origen's rebuttal to Kelsus. So we have to infer what Kelsus said uh, or, or find quotes of him in there. But Kelsus might have said more things than Origen responds to. Uh, but even if he didn't, uh, it still makes sense for Kelsus to take that position. That does not mean that Kelsus had secret inside knowledge that Jesus definitely existed. Uh, he didn't. He, he, he had no more knowledge. And he, his only source is the Gospels, like he admits. This is the only information that we have are the Gospels. <clears throat> so um, so anyway, you can explain and understand these things in, in, in context, but you do have to, like, you can make inferences based on these contexts. And I think that's why that kind of argumentation is important and not to just come at it with a presumption and then try to make the evidence fit your presumption. That That is the wrong way to come at history. Uh, and so when, when Chrissy Hansen is doing the one thing, she's on the right road doing, using the correct methodology. When she does the other thing, she's in Christian apologetics town. She's doing the exact same thing that Christian apologists do rather than like reliable scholars. Uh, and sometimes she slipped into one mode, sometimes in the other. And you just have to look for what she's doing in the argument and then fact check her. And then you'll find out which she's doing in any given case.